Um, hello to you all. Yeah. Welcome to today's session on the data modeling series. And, um, good afternoon to those of you who are connected from the UK and good morning to those who are connected from Ghana. And it's almost evening here in India, so good evening to those connected from India. Um, my name is Carlos and I'll be taking you through the session on data modeling. Uh, we normally have this session every Friday. On Tuesdays, we have a, a design thinking session with William. And we do this, we gather here to learn because we believe in the good mindset and we believe in continuous learning also. And as we continue to learn, we believe that, oh, someone says Nigeria. Okay, I think it should be good afternoon in Nigeria too. Yeah. <laughs> And we believe that uh, this would help us in our efforts to become relentless in our uh, improvement process. So um, we'll continue with our uh, data modeling session from last week. Um, <clears throat> so from last time, we looked at the data design process or the database design process. We talked about uh, the requirements gathering we move to the conceptual design, the logical design, then the physical design. The first one that we'll be looking at is requirements gathering. Um, but we'll not dwell too much on the requirements gathering because part of it is covered in the design thinking process. No, let me go back. So with that, you normally have uh, conduct interviews, you examine the existing systems in the organization and also the existing data you could use that to develop a use case or a use case model or develop your user stories. Now, so what you first need to look at whether you need a database. We looked at this um, last Friday, whether it is feasible for you to uh, use a database or just a spreadsheet could do the work for you. You need to consider your current budget, the technical skills that is available, whether you have the skills to manage the database, you need to look at the schedule because uh, de uh, designing the data could take some time. You need to look at the schedule you have and the contribution to the uh, objectives of the organization. All of these have to be taken into consideration before you start working. Then you start collecting the requirements. You conduct interviews with all the relevant stakeholders. You examine the data systems. It could be physical, it could be digital. So whatever digital systems that are in place, whatever physical or some people refer to it as manual systems that are in place, you need to examine all of these. You need to look at the existing data, whether you are getting them from reports, from spreadsheets, from business forms, from invoices, you need to get information from all of these. Then you now do the requirements, resolve any conflicts, remove any ambiguities, but all of this has to be in negotiation with the customer. You can't just do isolate yourself and do all of this. Then you specify and verify the requirements. This, as I said, I'm not going to talk too much about this. We'll move on straight to the conceptual design. So under the conceptual design, this is where we look at the entities, the attributes, and the relationships. I've mentioned these three in subsequent uh, sessions. So today I'll be explaining what they are and look at how to uh, apply them. <clears throat> so under the conceptual design, we specify the entities, the attributes, and the relationships. What is the input from that requirement specification in the previous step? So after going through all of that, whatever uh, documents or whatever ideas or data that you have is passed on into this um, process, what comes out of this? A conceptual schema. This is described using a conceptual data model like the entity relationship model. Normally, the entity relationship model is represented in with the form of a diagram. So it helps you to visualize the database as well. <clears throat> so we'll start with the entities. We said that the team defines the entities. So when we're talking about entities, we are looking at the logical things or the objects or the concepts that they want to capture data about. Who are they, the team? The team here, I'm not referring to only the developers or the database designer. I'm looking at the business analyst, the 
product owner, the product manager, the customer, whoever is involved, the developer inclusive, whoever is involved, all the stakeholders come into play here. The entities that will be identified could be people, they could be places, they could be products or anything that is tangible or even intangible in some way. But I think that in the whole design process, the beginning conceptual design stage is where you need the involvement of um, all stakeholders because they give you more ideas about how things operate. You can't rely on only the developers or the database designer to do this stage. And this is one of the most critical stages to be able to identify the relevant entities that you are designing or you are modeling the database for. <clears throat> so we'll take a company scenario for, uh, to build our entities and we'll look at the attributes and the relationship. So there's a company. So once we go through this, you could just visualize or conceptualize a company that you've worked for or you've partnered in some way. In that company, we want to um, identify like, okay, so all companies are different, so we can't model uh, a database that will suit all companies. So we are just going with some generic company and look at uh, what kind of concepts we need to come out of. So this a company. We'll first identify that the company has employees. And with employees, we could collect data about employees, so that would be our first entity. The employees work in departments or more like functional units. Most of the companies are categorized into some functional units. So you would have maybe the HR, the IT, the marketing, the sales, all of that. The employees work under these um, departments. So the departments could be one of the entities also. The employees work with some rules or job rules as we would refer to it, or some people call it positions. So every employee has some position or uh, a role that is assigned to him or her. Yeah, so that job role could be identified as another entity. Then maybe per our company, we are saying that projects, the companies, the employees work on projects based on the roles that they've been assigned. So they uh, apply those roles on the projects that they've been, they are, uh, they are working on. But there could be several other entities could be identified uh, as part of a company scenario. Some companies could have branches. So some of them, instead of working on projects, could be offering services or could be dealing in products, so they'll be selling. There could be some suppliers who are providing the products to the companies. There would be the customers who are engaging in sales to buy from the company. Some of the employees could have dependents, so the HR people might be interested in uh, who are the dependents of the employees. So all of these could be entities for the company, or I mean, yeah, for the company. But as I said, it depends on the company and the scope of the data that you are modeling. That will make you know which kind of entities to include. We can't cover every uh, entity in an existing company. So we just limit our sessions with four, only four of the entities, the employees, the departments, the job rules and the projects. Okay, now let's look at the attributes. After identifying the entities, we need to look at the attributes. With attributes, we are saying what specific data do you want to capture for each entity. We've identified four main entities and some other ones. Now for those entities, what do we need to, what kind of data do we need to capture about them? Let's take, for example, the employees. Maybe the employee has uh, a number or some form of identification. Some people would call it a staff number or a staff ID or any of that, yeah. So the employee has a number. The employee has a name. The employee has an age. Now, the age, I'm leaving it here. I'll come back to this in some subsequent or, yeah, sessions. I'll explain why we might have to change this age to maybe a date of birth. They have a phone number, a residential address. Uh, he works in a department, he has a job role, he has a social security number. Maybe we want to keep track of the date that the employee was hired also. So all of these are data about the employees. We call these the attributes because they describe the employee. These are, these are the data that describe the employee. 
Let's look at departments. This is also another entity. So someone say, okay, under department, we have HR, we have IT, we have finances, research department, all of this. But we would say, no, these are not attributes of department. I've witnessed a lot of people where they are designing databases and they would list this as attributes of departments. No, these are more like examples or members of the department entity. So for example, for employees, I have employees like Gideon, Juliet, Samuel, Barbara, Zafa. All of these people are members of the employee entity. So they are more like examples of employees, but they are not attributes. The same way with the department. So under department, instead of saying HR, IT, sales, research are the uh, attributes, would rather say the department should have a number, the department should have a name, the department could have a location, then it, should it could have a manager, and the date that the manager started managing that department, we want to keep track of that. These would be the attributes of the department. So let me take this again. The attributes we are seeing that they give further description to the entities. Employees, we've seen that all of these uh, give description to an employee. Departments, we are seeing that all of these give description to a department. Now, um, in a lot of cases, we are saying that the data, the entities that you identify, there should be some relationships among them. Relationships form a major part of the data modeling process. If your data, the data that you are collecting cannot be related, then you might as well not even bother building a database for it. Because I remember in the, the first session, I mentioned that the data should be related, should be logically related. So normally the databases that we build, we even call it the relational database because they have to be related. So you consider how each entity relates to each other. The relationships between entities are either the existing or significant associations among the entities. The existing significant associations between each of the entities. That is what we are calling the relationship. Now let's look at these um, entities again. We have employees, we have departments, projects, and then the job roles. We'll try to see how these uh, entities relate to each other in real life. Now, whatever associations we identify or we establish here is something that can be transformed into the database or it applies in the database also. So let's say employees work in departments. So that is a relationship. Every employee belongs to some a department or some form. That is some form of relationship. The employees have job roles or are assigned job roles. So the employee, you find someone is maybe um, an accountant, one is an engineer, another is an, uh, a manager or something. Employees. So that means that job roles could be assigned to an employee. That's some form of association. Employees work on projects. There are projects in the organization, but the employees would work on them. That creates some form of uh, an association. And projects belong to departments or they have a controlling department. Every project has uh, a department that controls it. So we'd say that the projects are connected to the department. There is a relationship here. Now, even in this a small uh, scenario that we are creating, you'd realize that all the entities should at least be connected to some other entity. If you create your database and there's an entity that is a loner, like he's on his own, he's not linked to anyone, you need to reconsider because the database ensures that everybody is connected to somebody. It helps to improve the structure of the database. So three things that we've looked at, entities, 
attributes and relationships. Um, okay, I will just run up then we'll take some discussion and questions. So first I said the entities are the objects or the things that we can collect data about even in the uh, organization or whatever scenario that you are building the database for. In this case, we have said we are using the company database. So we identified uh, entities like employees, departments, projects, job roles. We identified some other entities, but we're not going to use them in a scenario. We talked about uh, some companies are having branches, some could be offering some services or selling some products. They would want to know their customers and all of that. So all of these are possible entities. <clears throat> then each of the entities we said that would have attributes. So we mentioned the attributes in the previous slide. Attributes give further description to the entities. So an employee would have a number, would have a name, would have an age, an email, phone, and all of that. Then we now look at the relationships that exist among the entities. So after establishing this, then we can now go to model our data. There are different ways that we'd use. Mainly we'll use the entity relationship. If we are able to identify this, then we'll now visualize this that we have done by using some notations to connect the data and look at all the relationships that exist. The relationships, there are quite different uh, types of relationships. We have the one-to-one, -one, we have the one-to-many and the many-to-many. -many. But we'll look at that when we start modeling the database proper. Okay, so yeah, we'll now take some questions and answers and discussions on the the components of the conceptual design. Conceptual design, when we talked about the entities, the attributes and the relationships. So if you have any question, you can just unmute yourself or you could type it in the chat box. Yeah. Um, hi, Carlos. Uh, this, yeah, this is Debo and um, I'm speaking from the UK. Um, yeah. Thank you very much for this um, presentation. I'm, I'm, I'm very, very impressed. Um, although I have um, some sort of uh, a background knowledge in database and database design, but um, I think this is explaining a lot of the concepts that I found difficult to understand. Now, where's my question? Um, I'm not sure whether I'm jumping the gun. Um, I wanted to ask if you, if you, for example, you see in a job description or an interview, they're they are asking you about uh, data cleaning. Um, what should what should come to mind? Or, or um, the reason why I'm asking that question is I'm thinking that we have to be looking at the uh, the basics of uh, data. You know how you are building your database. Uh, you know how the structure is looking like and all that to ensure that you don't have either unvalidated data or, or uncorrupted data. So if I've not jumped the gun. Maybe you might probably um, explain a little bit further. What, 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 what's, what's the concept around data cleaning? Thank okay, you. So, yeah, yeah. And um, thank you very much for that. Now, there are a lot of the times that people don't model their data very well before they start building. A lot of that would bring errors or problems into the kind of data that you are you are storing. Now, last time I mentioned that. In, with the database, it is garbage in, garbage out. If you put in garbage, when you are generating your reports from your database, it's garbage that's going to come out. So it is at that stage that they realize, no, maybe we didn't uh, design our database or we didn't model our database well. That is why our reports are not giving us uh, what, we, what, is, what is supposed to come out. Then the data cleaning comes in. So the data cleaning comes in because maybe they are duplicating the data that has been stored, or maybe the data that is going in there has not been validated properly. A place where there should be phone number, then you find values with um, alphabets or letters in there. Maybe the date formats are so different. There are some of the dates that are being stored in maybe day, month, year. Some of them are month, day, year. Some of them are year, month, day, and all of that is mixed up then you need to come back to clean your data. 
So to prevent, and, and that is a lot of process. It's waste of time. It's expensive to clean your data. So normally it's always advisable to get it right from the beginning. So to do that, you need data building it meets certain criteria some of the criteria we could talk about it should have the uh, the key a unique key the unique key or the primary key is what to prevent the data from having duplicates then you pass it through the normalization process there are different stages it goes through the first normal form the second normal form the third normal form all of these are uh, processes or stages that helps to refine the data that goes into the database so that you don't have this kind of garbage where you need to come back to clean your data. Yeah. So in the subsequent sessions, we'll look at how we we'll model this data to avoid all this garbage to, to prevent the cleaning process. Yeah. I don't know if I've answered your question. Yeah. Yeah, you did. You did, um, you did answer uh, the question in the sense that the way I understand it is that data cleaning is not just uh, one concept. It is a process at which you arrive. It's more like, okay, do we need to go back and look at our structure? If we're okay with the structure, then at what point or in which area um, are we getting corrupted data or inconsistent data or duplication? But yeah. usually it would be around the architecture itself if, if it has not been properly defined or designed exactly. that way. Exactly. Thank you very much. Yeah. Any other questions or comments or additions to what we've discussed? Or if you have any experience on modeling data or identifying the entity, the attribute and the relationship, you could share that. Yeah. No, I think I think it's a good session. Um thank you for this. I, I I've done quite a bit of this in in, in, in my past life. So but I'm enjoying going back to the basics and this is you know and going through it. I mean, I've, I, I'm going back to the guy who talked about chain data. I've I've no. had that once, but that tends to be in an area where they already established some bad data practice themselves. So it's almost trying to unravel the mess they created mm. and and taking it back. Um, mm. Ideally, if if you if you're starting from scratch, you shouldn't have to clean anything. You, you should be able to create clean data from the very get go. Yeah. This tends to happen when people just created um, tables, you know, individually exactly. in teams, and then they try to bring it and they try to bring it together, and then all of a sudden there's repeated data all over the place. And then <laughs> I hate that, <laughs> but I've had that before in the past. Yeah, uh, and you, what you tend to end up is quite trying to agree with your um, customers that listen, um, this piece of data that's in your t in your data here, we're going to have to move it here and make sure that everybody's on board. And then, and then you normalize it because sometimes you get people who are, they get pressures with their data. Oh, we've, we've been using it this way for so many years. We don't want to change yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> then, that's very true. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and I think one of the key uh, aspects of data modeling is collaboration. The developer or the designer would think that, okay, this is how the technical person would want to do it. Then you get the customer or the product manager or the product owner also coming up with new ideas and all of that. You should be able to come to some agreement or understanding of how to. That is why it's relevant or it's good if the business analyst or the manager or the product owner has some idea about it's this. Then it helps the discussion. It brings out fruitful discussion during the process. Yeah. Okay, so Carlos. we have some few, yeah. Sorry, sorry for interrupting. Can I go? Can I go? Yeah. Through? Well, go ahead. yeah. I'm having technical issues here. Okay, it's Barbara here. Thank you very much for another really good session. Um, a quick question for you. As an, say as a new BA who is, or, or as a BA who is new to data migration integration um, projects, obviously there's going to be a lot of database modeling, languages and things floating about. How would you advise a BA who's never been exposed to database, you know, projects or data migration integration project to, to um, get on board and also grasp all these technologies and, and, and processes very, very quickly so that they can literally do what they do as in, be, you know, conduct their BA, you know, roles within this kind of task? Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, that's quite tricky. 
But what I would say is this, um, within the BA domain, you would, I mean like it's BA, but you have, you'd be operating in different domains. The first thing is to be able to understand the domain that you are working in, whether it's in insurance or in telecommunication or engineering or finance, you should understand the domain that you are operating in. Because the designer and the developer will be relying on your knowledge within that domain to be able to model a good database. Now, there are certain instances where the, the, the BA or the business uh, or the product owner is trying to explain a scenario and the technical guy is, okay, I would say that some of the technical guys, we are too uh, technically focused and we don't think business like something. So that's where the BA also comes in to try and bridge that gap. So the BA person now needs to understand the business side and then the data side because yeah. You are now going to explain from the customer's point of view and from the technical point of view. A good understanding of this model process would help you to, uh, to, to, to collaborate well with all the other members of the team. So, I mean, uh, taking a course in data modeling and uh, the design would be of great help to um, the business analysis. Okay, thank you. That's the yeah. answer. Thank you very much. Okay. Okay. To add to Carlos's uh, answers, they learn, join the sessions, find a mentor like Dapo, ask Carlos for a one to one session if you need to learn fast. Okay, brilliant. Thank you. Okay, so we'll round up our session here if there are no. Um, comments or questions one last question for you sorry okay. yeah, yeah uh, you, can't, you, you can't have it that easy <laughs> and <laughs> ne what's what's on the menu for next week and what can we start preparing for please okay so for next week we are going to look at some of the tools that we use to model a database or design the entity relationship model so that is more of the same thing that we have done but now we are trying to visualize it so it, there are some notations that we'll be using to link it up. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Okay. So thank you very much for today and join us next week, Tuesday for our design thinking session uh, with William. And yeah, so enjoy the rest of your day. <laughs>